Good afternoon. This is my 1987 Renault 11. And I think to some degree, it's an absolute heap, but it's my absolute heap. Um, Craig has just bought it back. Craig was the strange man from YouTube. Uh, well, he's not a strange man because he's my friend now, but he was a strange man from YouTube who offered to fix this car for me when I bought it. Should never have bought it in the first place, but let me show you the car and see if I can talk you through some of my crazy plans and maybe you can talk me out of them while we do it because I'm not sure what to do with this car, but I do have a, a sort of plan. I just don't know if it's a good idea or not. I mean, it'd be funny, but let's have a look. So, 1987, 1.4, five speed manual gearbox very simple gold wheels just been mot'd i paid a thousand pounds for it believe it or not uh i drove it home broken it's had loads and loads of work done to it which i'm going to put at the end of this video because this is going to be a short video because i want to talk you through my plans for the car and basically i want you to tell me either i'm crazy or to do something else or just get on with it and do it why not I'm thinking, because Harry Metcalf just posted a video of him driving a 1987 red car with gold wheels all the way down to the bottom of Spain, I'm thinking I might do the same in this. So shall I jump in this car and drive it to Alicante and do some of the roads that Harry did? Or should I use a better car for that? I'd be quite funny in this car, but at the same time, I need to fix the driver's window regulator because that doesn't work, but it has just been MOT'd. It's refreshingly simple inside. There is nothing to it. And as Craig says, it is actually, although it doesn't look it, in fairly good health at the minute, having just had an MOT and loads of work done, including a complete replacement of the rear axle. There's a slight knocking coming from the front, but I'm gonna drop in the video here of Craig and I chatting when he brought the car to me. And maybe you could tell me in the comments what you think I should do. Should I do the trip in this car? Should I buy something different for the trip? Should I put this straight to landfill? And you know, I'm not gonna do that. It's done 180,000 miles and it's almost as old as me and it's still here. So the landfill isn't really an option. Um, I think the answer is what I end up discussing in the video with Craig is that I need to get some miles on the car. <laughs> look at it, it's such a funny looking thing. I need to do some miles in it and see if I'm comfortable driving it that sort of long distance and see if it breaks. So I'll try and break it. And if it doesn't break, then I'll do a big road trip in it. Anyway, roll the tape of my conversation with Craig and you tell me in the comments what you think I should do with this car. Thank you for watching. Ladies and gentlemen, you should never ever meet strange men off the internet. Yes, because this happens. This is Craig, right? If you cast your mind back a while ago, I bought this car, this is my Renault 11, and um, I said on YouTube, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it or how I'm gonna fix it. Craig, you came pretty much the next week yep. and drove it away. This was September? No, it would have been just before Christmas. Was it? Yeah, it was uh, the week before Christmas. Week before Christmas, there you go, not September. Um, anyway, it had a broken torsion bar, yeah. which gave me the least comfortable drive I've ever had. It was very bouncy. Bought it back with Stockport with one wheel on the floor, and you took it away and fixed it. Yes. So talk everybody through what you've done. Well, I suspected it was a simple fault that I could just fix on my driveway, because I know a few old Renaults and I've done that. And it, as soon as I looked underneath it, I realised it wasn't. It was a broken axle. So I reached out to Jeff. We had a look at pricing some spare parts and they were very expensive and quite hard to get. So we put the, the distress call out on Jeff Buy's cars yeah. and somebody contacted you and says, here's a bit of history for the car and an axle that I know is for the right car because that's my old car. And I bought the axle for it knowing it was going to fail. Brilliant. So he said, if you want it, come and get it. So we did. And you went down to London, didn't you? Yeah, Walthamstow dog track. To <laughs> fetch the axle. The day after the, uh, the day of the Abdul Manthan. Amazing. Which way are we going? We're coming off. Yeah, come, on, come off of this one. Um, so, but you've not, uh, so you fitted the rear axle because the torsion beam was knackered basically. Yeah. And it needed a whole axle. And we transferred all of the drum brakes were good on the 
broken axle and uh, everything was knackered on the axle that we just bought. So we turned it right. Take it right here, yeah. Um, so we had to swap over all of the brake drums, brakers, shoes, assemblies, drums and everything. Pick the best out of them all. So they got new rear wheel cylinders. They'd all been overhauled fairly recently. Yeah. We transferred all that across and make all the metal brake pipes for the to go down the axle. Yeah. And that and the new shock absorbers that you bought that are for the Renault 11 Turbo. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then she promptly flew through an MOT. So now, well, last week we got a fresh MOT on this car. Yeah. It is now tax and insured and MOT. We have a triple whammy of legality. It is, and she's... It goes fairly well, doesn't she it? She really does. She's a fun, she, uh, so rust of all, she so, showed a clean set of heels to some sporty little Audi A3. So there you go. The, there was a Jeff car at rust of all. I don't know if anyone noticed that this car was at rust of all. It did have it the there. clues. It had a Jeff Byers car dash, uh, mug on the dashboard <laughs> and the new MOT certificate on the on the dash. <laughs> yeah, on display. It, it was MOT the day yeah. before, wasn't it? And the, the guy who did the work on the car was quite surprised because people kept coming into his garage and showing him photos and saying, When's Jeff's car going to be fixed? And he's like, <laughs> it's not Jeff's car, it's the Land Rover guy from down the road. Brilliant. Um, well, no, I, I appreciate it because I mean, you've basically done everything. Yeah, take a left over here. Yeah. So, it's ready for, there's quite a knocking from the front in there. What do you reckon that is? Um, don't know. It's had new anti-roll bar bushes. Yeah. Um, but we couldn't find any play or anything under there, so it might be a mystery, a, mystery knock. Yeah, mystery knock. Yeah. But this is the furthest I've driven. The furthest I've driven it was picking it up. Yeah. And, and this is the furthest I've driven from. I've only driven a grand total of about eight miles in it, so getting the work done. This is the initial road test. Um, yeah. I'm going on my plan. What mileage are you on now? 180. 182,000 miles yeah. on a little Renault. Yeah. Uh, Which is going to be, that's good going anyway. For and it's from 1987. Yeah. So it's uh, one year not as old as me. So it's, that yeah. makes it 36, 37 years that's old. It. Well, I was born in 1980. So when this rolled off the, off the dealership, I was spending almost that entire year wearing a Superman costume. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, but the thing is, people say that old cars, you know, uh, they don't last forever. I'm actually planning on, I'm going to do some miles in this car in England first, but I'm going to drive this car to Spain. Well, this car in three or four years is going to be very valuable because this is a classic. So in three or four years, this is going to be tax MOT and everything except it is, yeah. Because it'll be forty years old in three years. Yeah, we just got up to nineteen eighty four for tax and yeah. for tax exemption. So nineteen eighty seven, three years away. We're all down there. Yeah, keep going down it. Um, so this is going to be like a phenomenally valuable car in three years. I won't go that far. It's still twenty five. How many shades of red do you reckon it is? Oh, four. All of at least four. Yeah. All of the shades of red. Yes. Uh, high, high, pink. high mileage, but it, it, it's nice to drive, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really zappy little car. It's it's in really rude health, and it, it's, it was up on the workshop ramps in the garage for two weeks getting the axle and bit swapped over because it was done in between other jobs. Yeah, and um, the amount of people that come over, like every other person that comes in, goes, "Ooh, one of them!" Yeah, and, and just goes over to have a nose and a look at it. So yeah, and I, I haven't really driven it anywhere. And one of the only places I drove it to Rustaville. Um, and ironically, Ristoval was only like three minutes down the road from me, and I had to stop twice for broken down cars. Yeah. And everybody was like, oh, it's a Jeff Bobby Cars car. <laughs> That's funny. Because it only appeared on the channel very briefly. Yeah, and most of it was photos as well. It was... Yeah, because it was very broken, and I didn't want to admit to people that the rear torsion bar had broken, and then I'd driven it 100 miles. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things. Because I only drive it, it's 37 miles when I picked it up. Yeah. And it was very let's not hit any potholes and oh it was bad wasn't yeah. it it was bad it was a bit yeah it was really harsh on your back as well it felt like a car that had been torpedoed but now it feels like a french hatchback from yeah. the 80s no, and it's, it's proper it? chuckable and nimble and it's 1.4 it's a five speed like you say it's quite chuckable yeah. and i find this cabin quite a nice place to it's, be i really <laughs> like the interior it's quite funky and nice and everything black awesome. dash beige carpet so it's nice and light yeah. and People who watch a lot of YouTube will probably know that yesterday Harry Metcalf posted a video of him taking his red 1987 car with a beige interior and gold wheels all the way down to Spain. 
So I'm basically going to do exactly the same. Beige interior. Beige interior. <laughs> Beige interior. I quite like the, the, the sheep. They're quite comfortable. I had them in Australia. They're very nice in hot weather. They're nice in hot yeah, weather. Yeah, because okay. they don't burn you when you get in. It's nice. It's soft, lots of air in it. Yeah. I, I, I just like the general look and feel of the car. It's quite a happy place to yeah, be. Yeah, it's quite fruity. And it's so my, my rough plan at this stage is a ferry to... Sorry. Left. Uh, we're going all the way down to Upton to yeah. Fiesta. So I'm going to drive the car all the way down to Plymouth and then get a ferry to Santander and then drive Santander all the way down to Alicante. I'm planning on having a holiday with my wife and kids. I'm going to bring them out with me. I don't know if they're coming in the car or flying out. I'll probably fly them out. And then after that, they can go home after the Easter break. And the MacMaster is hopefully going to fly out to Benidorm and myself and Lee can do some driving stuff. So we've got a few thousand miles wow, to yeah. put on this car. Yeah. That's the plan anyway, but as you know, most, you know, best plan. My plans one tip, like. it doesn't cost much difference on the ferry. Have a look at going to Bilbao. Yeah. A little bit further in and um, I always found in experience that the ferry was quieter and quicker. Well, this is the thing. Um, I've been weighing it up, but initially I was thinking you just jump on the shuttle. But it's when you look at the cost and time of driving all the way down through France, French tolls are a bastard. I think the money ends up coming out about the same because you've got to have a hotel, basically. Sorry, left here. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting watching Harry Metcalf's video. He he didn't do that either. He didn't drive the cars all the way there, but he spent nine thousand pounds on having a lorry take them there for him. Yes, which is and a bit of a different world to Jeff buys cars, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I've done a lot of European stuff years ago. And I know from experience that if you do the journey, you always spend more than you think because you're going to pull over for a couple of hours and m visit a museum or have a nice meal or do something, and that's going to happen a few times. Um, we, we, ju we just found doing it as a family, we've done that a couple of times, and you can budget for okay, it's going to be X in fuel, X in tolls, and X in hotels. And as you say, at the hotel, you will spend more money because yeah. you're going to want more beers than you thought you did because you've just driven all day. Yeah. And everything's a reward for you. And, exactly. And yeah, that's yeah. it. And so, I used to, well, I had to run a motorbike shop, a scooter shop, and Italy shuts down in August. Yeah. So Piaggio used to fly us over to get whatever bits we wanted, and they would pay for the flights. Yeah. Um, but they would only pay for the flights one way. Yeah. So me and my missus would fly over there, literally run around the Piaggio factory getting our stock for August and September, uh, and then try and buy a, a scooter in the village. Yeah. So we've ridden back on a Vespa GS150. From Italy? From San Remo, Italy. <laughs> and a, uh, I once rode back, my missus flew back, and I rode back on a Vespa with the frame of a Lambretta on straps on my back. And never once did anybody ask me for any registration documents. I drove all the way, Italy, France, Dover, Calais, and literally driving on the A2 out of Dover, I think a couple pulled me over and said, oh, you're a number plate. <laughs> what kind of speeds can you do on those? Um, because that's a long trip. Yeah, Mont Blanc is a bastard on a Vespa. Yeah, there I is no it getting is. around it. Uh, especially when we did it once two up with the camping gear, because the first time we did it, we just said, oh, we'll drive up through France and stop at all the campsites. And yeah. No. On a Vespa with, a, with your missus who's, to be kind, a size 16. Um, Together yeah. on the same bike? On the same 150cc How Vespa. many miles can you do a day on a Vespa uh, like that? About 850 miles. In a day? In a day. Just get it going, keep it going. Love it. Love it. That's part of the thing I want to do this. I'm curious just to see, like, let, my, my, my dream is that I get the ferry and it lands in the morning and then I can just drive all day. Yeah. Do the whole thing. I used to, when I used to do, I used to do Andorra two or three times a year in a transit van. Yeah. And I used to go down to Bilbao and the morning ferry port, uh, the, the, the night boat ports at about four in the morning or something stupid yeah so you actually get out and you manage to make a couple of hours before any traffic gets on the road yeah and depending where you're going you can be halfway there and i, I love it because i just enjoy, i just really enjoy sitting in a car long distance yeah, i do actually that's why i love trade bike i did it for years yeah i i always all the people hated the jobs i was like as a young lad i was like what do you mean we're only paid by this by the mileage and it's 110 miles to london that's 395 miles to Scotland, I'll take that one, thanks. Yeah, to do all the long distance yeah. ones that no one wants to do. And then you got a reputation for doing it, and I made friends with all the dealers. But then, again, like, I was driving Vauxhall Astras, was the most common car I used to take up there. Yeah. You take Vauxhall up there, Astra up there, drop it off, sometimes take people up, and when you were driving in your own car, and I was driving up there, and I was, Peugeot 309 GTI. 
Yeah. Great car. Yeah. Drive all the way to Scotland in it. Oh, I wanted to burn it. Really? Oh. <laughs> with my stainless steel exhaust uh, and all the right, rest I of it. I got you, yeah. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. all right. So I went to the auctions and I bought myself a Merc S Class. At yeah. the age of 19 with a Merc S Class. Yeah. Five litre V8. Great. Because if you're driving to Scotland, fuck me, it was just beautiful. You sit 120 mile an hour and just. Yeah. It's like driving a cathedral. And then you realise that you're having to work twice as hard because your car's only doing 17 to the gun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in those days, you could you could do you could do long distance, long speeds. Yeah. Because there was less issues with cameras and traffic and all the stuff that you. Genuinely, on getting on a motorway, especially if you weren't in rush hour, I used to set my speedo by a cruise control at 110. Yeah. I used to get across to the lane and you'd keep up. As soon as traffic thinned out, you get up to 110 and you'd sit there. And as soon as you saw a van, a camera, anything, you lift off and you do 100 mile an hour, and 100 mile an hour is six points. Yeah. Yeah, you know, under 100 mile an hour is three points and 60 yeah. quid. Yeah. I only ever got one speeding ticket, and that was on my motorbike. So. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, you probably tell if you're still watching this video, Craig's got a story for everything. <laughs> I'm a high mileage hero. Do you <laughs> want to tell your motorbike speeding story or not? Which one? Because I've got a few. The one that basically means you probably have the highest ever oh. speeding ticket that was unconvicted. Yes, uh, I got a notice of intended prosecution. Several police officers turn up at my motorbike shop because I'd not long bought a ZX 12R, um, which was a very fast Kawasaki, and I only bought it because it was a very fast Kawasaki. I wasn't. I sold Vespers, yeah. but I went out and bought this Kawasaki that had got an engine fault because it was cheap, and we promptly modified it a little bit. And I got pursued down the M69 motorway. Uh, well, we outran the Volvo and something else. I don't even know what it was. Yeah. And then a f uh, uh, we looked behind us. Or well, I looked behind me over my shoulder, and there's a fucking uh, there's a helicopter following us. <laughs> so we linked it up all the way down the M69, and he was more or less keeping up with us, losing a bit of speed on him. And um, we had to go and hide in the pub next to Coventry Airport. Amazing. Because I know, I happen to know the rules that the police aren't allowed anywhere near the restricted airspace of the airport. Yeah. So I ran into the airport, hid my bike in the behind the toilets, dumped my motorcycle helmet and my uh, all my kit in the toilets, <laughs> and sat at the bar and watched all the police cars flying up and down the road. Amazing. While my brother came in the van to pick me up. Amazing. So, what kind of speed do you think that that would have been? That was uh, 206 mile miles per hour over the measured mark. <laughs> measured from the helicopter and I've since spoken to some of the officers on that force and the for future reference to anybody um, the police helicopter maximum speed is 177 mile an hour they can get it up to about 185 mile an hour but they need a lot of altitude to do it so that's interesting because I'm sure there are people in the comments calling bull on the story right mm -hmm. but I remember back in the day a motorbike magazine ran a story about doing more than 200 miles an hour on the motorway at night. Do you remember yeah. the article? Um, it was probably it was a bike magazine. Bikes magazine. Was it? Might have been, I think. And that was, that, was a ZX, that was a ZX12. And we had a lot of the guys from Bike Magazine and Performance Bike used to use our shop as a bit of a meeting space because they're all based in Peterborough. Yeah. Their bikes would get delivered from London. Yeah. And we were in Leicester, right by the motorway, so it was dead handy for them. Yeah. So we knew Ronnie Smith and a few of the other journalists used to come and hang around in our shop. Yeah. Um, and um, a couple of the guys from Bike Magazine and Ride have ridden my ZX12R. A few of the articles, my bike was the, the bike in the magazine. Yeah. Um, and mine, what did we have to do? We put an exhaust on it, altered the fuel map, took the wing mirrors off it, which made a big difference. Yeah. Uh, put a silly flat screen on it. Uh, and the rest of it was a few weeks playing around with different size sprockets and tyres. Yeah. Um, and then you've got a genuine 200 mile hour bike. Mile hour. And, and to be honest, when I bought the bike, it was doing 199 to 200 anyway on the cops. Yeah. Um, because it was because it was the first bike that was actually built to do 200 mile an hour. There was a rumour that the first few hundred bikes into the UK hadn't been restricted. Right. And uh, we got told it was the first 300 bikes, of which this was one. Yeah. And I paid peanuts for it because they were a ceramic board lined block. Yeah. And mine, the dealer, had took it apart and knew the ceramic coating had cracked. Right. 
So um, when I bought it, that was we got our mechanic to strip it down. Cowboy move of the year. Went down the fire fireplace shop and bought some fire cement. So you fire cemented the ceramic lining of the piston. Yes. <laughs> no work. Yeah, well yeah. ran, didn't smoke much. Wow. And I bought the bike for 1400 quid, had it for two years, and sold it for like 1800 quid. So. Yeah. And the person I sold it to, it is a bomb. Yeah. It is dead, it is voided of warranty. <laughs> yeah. But goes like a train, mate. Do you think that, that was the real heyday of fast bikes? What do you think bike things have done since then? I, the, uh, I used to know all bikes, everything. Yeah. And I stopped. And I rode a, Z uh, a BMW SB1000 when they came out, yeah. the 1000cc superbike, and I rode it back to the shop and went, you can have that back, it's horrible, give me my fire blade back. Yeah. Um, because it had got traction control, ABS, and to be honest, if, if, if it's a sports bike, it shouldn't have them. Yeah. Um, so I hate, you get in a modern GTI and you have to press the traction control off. Yeah. I paid a grand for the GTI badge and the nice wheels, mate. Turn the tracking control on when I want you to turn it on, not the default one. So a similar thing has happened in bikes that has happened in cars, which is everything after about 2006, 7, 8, 9. Has become progressively. You start to load them up with all this tech. Get yeah. Kick going, yeah, by the way. Um, when we had it in the scooters, here, and I sold the shop in, well, quit the shop in 2004. Yeah. To the end of 2004 and 2005. And we had, you could come and buy a scooter that had remote central unlocking, cruise control, DAB radio, and it's on a scooter. Yeah. It's just getting too complicated. And my workshop is full of bikes where I'm, I'm trying to, it's in the workshop for hours and hours tying up the staff because some kid wants his airplay to work on his 50cc moped. <laughs> yeah. And we, the, we had the first 50cc two stroke yeah. fuel injected. Yeah. So we had fuel injected two strokes come in for a 50cc and you're like, what's the point? It's changed as well because when, when I was 16, you dreamed of a 50cc yeah. bike and I don't think the kids today do. No, I wanted, I didn't want a bike at all until somebody turned up at my school legitimately on L plates on a Yamaha DT50. Yeah. And I was like, how are you on that? He's like, oh, you can ride these at 16. I've passed my CBT test. And then I was just, I literally, I already owned the car. Yeah. I had a Metro on the driveway, and I was like, Dad, I want to sell my Metro and get a DT. I can drive it now. Yeah. And um, my dad had to work very hard at keeping me in the car. It's getting harder and harder for everybody to get on the road on bikes, though. Um, was it Axler the other day announced that they're removing all of their motorbike like, insurance underwriting? Yeah, yeah. And camper vans, I think. Really? Yeah, I think they're getting rid of camper vans. So. Have fun now, basically, yeah. while you can. Go and buy something now and, and get it insured. So are you still a bike man? I am. I've been considering that for the last few weeks. Do I buy a scrap car and not register it in my name? Yeah. And park it at the end of my road and just be careful? Yeah. Or do I be honest and go and tax and insure something like this Fiesta? Yeah. And just use that, because that's a low tax car. Yeah. But it's still 240 quid. Yeah. Um, road, road tax thing is a lot of people have contacted me about this now because it's a real car killer, it isn't is, it? Yeah. And I'm like, well, actually, do I now think, well, I'm a single bloke, I've got a dog, so I ain't gonna really carry kids and children around. Yeah. So do I just go out and buy something like uh, a little 200cc motorbike? Yeah. Because the road tax is going to be 40 or 50 quid a year. All right, I'll get wet when it rains, but I'm a biker. I've done that for years. So. Yeah. I drive a Land Rover, so I normally get wet when it rains anyway. Yeah. And um, my Land Rover is 379 quid to tax this year. Yeah. It's going to be 750 quid to insure. And it does 24 to a gallon on a good day. It's getting price, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's like not going to happen. So and this this one's one of the lower tax brackets. So this, but, but even this is still 210 pounds yeah, a year. Yeah, it's rude. Well, the car is worth a grand. Yeah, I would say that's about what she's worth. Which is exactly what I paid for it. So once you take off all the money that I'm going to have to pay you for fixing it, um, I mean, negative equity quite significantly with yes. this car. Not that that really matters because... That's what, one of the things, at least you know what you've got. But the other thing is, I got a car with a broken torsion bar. What are my options? 
like yeah. scrap. It was it at a that car point. killer without the point, without the part. That was just a thousand pound down the drain. So a big thank you to the gentleman who, who uh, contacted us with that. Well, exactly. And there's been a few people that have got in touch with bits and bobs of information on this car. So, and I hate to see a car taken off the road. So even though it owes me more than I can probably get out of it, um, at it, least you have saved a good, yeah, a exactly. Worthy car. And it's a high mileage year. I mean, one hundred and eighty-two thousand and fifty-two miles. It's pretty impressive. On a 1.4. And it's still here. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, it just works. Everything on it is, you know, it's a, little, it's a 20 odd year old car, but. Yeah. It's all present and correct. So, would you drive it a thousand miles? Yeah. Yeah. I really would. I wouldn't be that concerned about it. The only thing I'll give you is that battery isolator because the battery is a bit weak on it. Oh, we could chuck a battery on it before we go. That's yeah. no problem. I've ordered some spares, as you advised. Yeah. Dizzy just cat, rotor arm, spare clutch cable because the clutch cable is held on by how many yeah, spacers? I think I've worked out it's a load of washers and we think what somebody has done is they couldn't get the clutch cable because I tried to order one and they don't turn up. Yeah. We think somebody put a Renault 25 or a Renault Clio one on it. And spaced it. And spaced it to yeah. fit. But that's the kind of like bush mechanics yeah. that allows this car to still be here, isn't it? That's it, and I know why it's happened, because I tried to order the same clutch cable and it just never turned up. Well, I ordered a clutch cable and it has apparently turned up, but oh, whether, right. whether it's the right one or not, we'll yeah. see. I'll but, chuck it in the boot for when we go. Yeah, that's it. This one's in there and it works and it's not in any danger of snapping anytime yeah. soon, so... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some miles on this car. Um, we've got a few weeks before. It almost looks like a screen there, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> and I, I have actually got a DIN 1 radio that would fit in there, somewhere yeah. I'm thinking. Um, I'm going to get some miles on this car before I go, just to check it. And then if it does all right over, you know, 500 miles in England, it's going to be fine driving to Spain, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, cool. I feel like it's it's destined to be, especially as Harry Metcalf recently did exactly the same thing in an almost identical car. Yes, it does seem to. And obviously with Auto Alex having the BX. Yeah. Um, but I think he's now passed it on to the detailing guy. And we did text him. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine sold him a car and we have sent him a text saying, do you want to drive the BX down to Spain? Because the two cars look exactly they the same. They do, they're so, they were the direct contest in the- We in haven't the heard anything back, but that's fine. What's going on here? What are we waiting for? Well, temporary traffic lights down there. Oh, so, excellent. Yeah. Lots of temporary traffic lights around I live the near HS2 Works at the moment, so I had, there's six temporary traffic lights in my village and there's only four roads in the village. HS2 is just a real shit show, isn't it? I know, yeah. Absolute diabolical waste. Do you know what my BMW X5 is really good at? knocking down road closed signs. <laughs> My Land Rover is quite good at this. <laughs> anyway, so that's Craig. This is my Renault. We're now at the destination we need to be at. There'll be more on this car on the channel soon. Um, what spares do you think I should take with me? I've got a dizzy cap, got a rotor arm. Uh, I don't know thermostat? If I'll, I'll get a thermostat. A thermostat. Um, blah, blah, blah. A can of air duster spray. A can of air duster, like you said. Um, Spare set up um, leads. Yeah. Uh, can of Easy Start, yeah. Uh, which uh, there's one in here. Bit of coolant, bit of water, yeah. Bit of oil. And uh, annoyingly, she's really economical because she's. I've just noticed the gauge move for the first time, and she's got. Well, a, I've, I've read that this is like a 42 miles to the gallon car, and possibly a little yeah. bit better on a run. Yeah. So I it's not actually a saying. bad choice for a road trip. No. Also, I'm driving through France and Spain. Go for it. Um, I'm driving through France and Spain, and I figure if I do break down, it's probably a car. They were sorry that way. Oh, my bad. My bad. It's probably a car that they recognise anyway. Yeah, that's it. You will probably get more spares for this in France and Spain than you will here. Yes. Because everywhere I tried to get spares from, it turned out they were coming from France and they haven't actually got them. I'm not concerned about getting there. I think my I think my major concern about the trip is, I've got two concerns. One, getting down to the bottom of Spain and then not wanting to come home. Yes. That's a big one. Uh, and two, not wanting to drive this home and then what do I do with it if I can't be bothered to uh, drive it home? I was going to mention this. You do realise you have a legal obligation when you take a car in that you can't leave it in Spain. Right. Um, Large fire? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I've left a few vehicles, uh, no, well, not in Spain, in France. Yeah. If I've got shit to leave, I might as well leave it in France. So yeah. I'm keen on French. Um, but yeah, bringing vehicles... Bring it, leaving a vehicle in Spain for it, for any reason that you came over in can yeah. be a bit of a problem. Right. Um, I'll so take leave, the number it, leave it in France. Yeah. Check, a, check a right onto this little thing and we'll find this garage and find the Fiesta. So yeah, don't leave it in France, drive it across the border. Yeah. All right. Lovely. That is it for now. There's plenty more to come on this car. Will it make it to Spain? Will I even take it to Spain? What do you think? Is it a good idea for me to drive this to Spain or should I do what I always do, just buy a Volvo? <laughs> 